Welcome to Radical Personal Finance, a show dedicated to providing you with the knowledge, skills, insight, and encouragement you need to live a rich and meaningful life now while building a plan for financial freedom in 10 years or less. My name is Joshua Sheets. I'm your host. Today is Friday, April 14, 2023. Today on this Friday, as on every other Friday in which I can arrange the appropriate recording technology, we record a live Q&A show. Works just like Call and Talk Radio. You call in, ask about anything that you want, make any comments on the show, make any uh, agreements, disagreements, examples, ask any questions, etc. If you would like to gain access to this show, you can do so by becoming a patron of the show at patreon.com slash radical personal finance, patreon.com slash radical personal finance. Reminder that up through the end of April, I am running personal consultations. You can book a consult with me at a discounted price through uh, here in April of 2023 uh, at uh, radicalpersonalfinance.com slash consult. If you can't afford an individual private consultation, then the best way to talk to me personally is to join one of these Q&A shows. And you do that again by going to patreon.com slash radicalpersonalfinance. We begin with Kyle in Washington. Kyle, welcome to the show. How can I serve you today, sir? Joshua, thank you. I uh, have purchased J.J. Luna's book, um, How to Be Invisible. I haven't cracked it, nor have I cracked a recipe yourself. However, uh, something I've been thinking a lot about is DNA privacy, and I have done a little bit of looking um, around about what to do with these private companies that my family, extended family and the like, enjoy sending their DNA samples to for genealogy reports and things of that nature, and I'm just curious if you've thought at all about that sort of thing and what we can do about it, if anything. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to mute you for a moment. I think you're on a, a hands-free handset. So if you can go off of that, it would be great. I was able to, it, it should be usable, but let's see if we can get on to uh, off of the hands-free to help me get better audio. Uh, in terms of, have I thought about it? Absolutely. <laughs> I've thought a lot about it. Uh, there's probably nothing more private than our own individual DNA. And obviously this is one of those technologies that can be a tremendous blessing and simultaneously has tremendous potential for harm. Let's focus first on the positive side of it. Uh, the tremendous blessing side of it is simply that this is technology that can help to find people who are guilty of crimes. This is technology that can help to free people who are not guilty of crimes. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Innocence Project, and I am so grateful to see many people being set free from who are who've been wrongly imprisoned being set free due to DNA testing, uh, etc. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this can be certainly abused. I read a novel recently, uh, I can't remember the author or the name of it, but I read a novel recently, uh, I'll look it up in my Audible here in a moment, uh, but it was the entire, uh, the entire basic point of the novel was based upon uh, the use of DNA te testing technology as, uh, as a as a foundation for somebody going out and finding people who had a genetic predisposition. It wound up being a serial killer who was tracking people down through a data leak from an online uh, DNA uh, service. And he was going out and tracking people down who had a predisposition to um, sexual addiction, something like that. Basically people who would be easy for him to uh, connect with and he would track them down. And anyway, it's a very interesting novel, but it's just an example of the, of the potential uh, for harm uh, of this particular technology. And then you think about, uh, well, what could happen if, if this technology goes farther? I think a lot of people are, are worried about being falsely imprisoned. Uh, you know, you go out and, and some of your DNA gets left somewhere and all of a sudden you get falsely imprisoned. It's, it, it's potentially quite scary. Uh, it's quite scary if this stuff is in the hands of government agents and you get a rogue government. Just imagine what, what a, an evil dictator could do with access to this information. Uh, and I think that I try to keep myself mostly on the, on the whole plus side. Uh, a number of years, a few years, in the past couple of years, there was a, a murderer who was discovered through the fact that one of his family members had submitted his DNA uh, to a to a DNA service, and they tracked him down because there was DNA left at the crime scene. I can't I can't cite the name and and the, all the data right now extemporaneously, but. That, on the one hand, it shows the tremendous danger because you can be tracked down by your family members. And as you stated, usually it's your family members who will expose you. Uh, 
you know, you can do all you want not to have TikTok uh, because you're worried about the Chinese Communist Party harvesting your data. But guess what? They don't come after your TikTok. They come after your teenage daughter's TikTok. And that's where they get the data from. Uh, and so in most when people are looking for people, it's usually your family members that will wind up betraying you uh, and your location. So my point is, I try to console myself by focusing on the positive side and say, this is a technology that can be used for good. I'm glad that killers are behind bars. Uh, I'm glad that innocent people can be set free. I'm glad that there is a higher, uh, there, there's increasing evidence that can be brought to bear um, on on criminal cases. Uh, I'm optimistic that we can use some of the DNA evidence to provide individualized personal health advice for people based upon their genetic code. This is certainly a new frontier in medicine, and I'm hoping that it will help us to extend people's lives, etc. So I try to console myself by looking at the positive side of all of this, because quite frankly, I have no solution uh, to, to eliminate it. Uh, the analogy I would draw would be between the use of fingerprint uh, testing or fingerprint dusting and identification at crime scenes. This is a technique that before the technique was invented, uh, it, it there were many people who were not caught for their crimes, or at least it wasn't proven. But then once this technique was invented, then... Uh, we've been able to identify with greater certainty that such and such a suspect was at a crime scene. And again, I stand on the, on the side of rule, uh, the rule of law. I want criminals to be in prison. That is the job of the government. The government's job is to stop wrongdoers in society, stop evildoers. That's their job. And so I'm grateful for that. Fast forward, though, you can't really, how do you, you can't do anything about the fact that the technology exists except not leave fingerprints. Now, DNA would give a similar, a similar example, but not quite as good. The similar example is at very least what you can do is not participate, not, not give your own DNA. So I'm not sending off my DNA to uh, any kind of, of testing service. I'm not, I'm interested in my genetic history, but I'm not going to do it. Um, maybe in theory, if there were some way I could be certain about the, the DNA uh, results, uh, then, okay, fine. I would, uh, I, maybe I would like to have some of that individualized insight, but I can't imagine how I would be satisfied about the safety of the data. Uh, it drove me crazy to do COVID tests. Uh, I don't think that, uh, th I never came across any solid evidence that, uh, or any evidence at all. Let me be clear. I never came across any evidence that anybody was using COVID tests to collect, uh, DNA evidence from everybody and doing any kind of testing on that. But on the other hand, although I never came across any evidence, I can't imagine why some countries and governments weren't doing that. When you can collect large DNA samples from a people, from a population, there's all kinds of interesting tests you can do, again, most of which is positive. And so I, didn't, I never liked doing COVID tests because I was conscious about the fact that I'm giving away a sample of, of bodily fluids that could be used for uh, DNA testing if someone were so motivated. Uh, the biggest, I try to encourage my family members not to do it. Um, but I, I have no control over what other people do. And I've just come to terms with the fact that privacy is not something that's particularly important to most people. So what I try to, what I really want to make very sure that I do is I want to make sure that I'm squeaky clean in everything I do. I don't want to be ever in a, on the scene of a crime. I don't want to be, uh, I just want to be really smart and really careful and never be involved with anything. I want to keep my actions above board. And I think if you do that, it's not worth worrying about because you can't change it. I think there are some things that are smart. So for example, one of my pieces of advice I give to parents is one of the things I think parents should do, go to the store, get a high quality, uh, or get a brand new toothbrush, uh, take it home uh, and make sure you use that brand new toothbrush and swab your, your child's mouth and make sure that uh, you do it really thoroughly. And then take that toothbrush, put it in a plastic bag, put it in the freezer and store it somewhere safe, uh, you know, relative's house, something like that. Um, because I think that parents should have a DNA sample of their children uh, in case you ever have to do uh, investigate, a, you know, there's a body or some other kind of thing where you need to engage in some kind of DNA evidence. It's important to have 
a DNA sample available to you in those circumstances. So that's the best I got. I don't see any, uh, any way around it other than just to hope that it turns out to be a positive technology and that we have longer lifespan and criminals are behind bars, but I'm acutely aware of the dangers. Fair enough. <clears throat> Excuse me, frog in my throat. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. I appreciate that. As far as I can tell, yeah, the only thing you can do is don't get in trouble and have a good lawyer. Um, <laughs> But aside from that, I don't know what a guy, yeah, you can't claw back that stuff from when you start reading the terms of service from Ancestry or 23andMe or no. whatever. They own, they own you once you give yourself to them. Yep, so. absolutely. Yeah. And right. at the end of the day, I mean, there are so many risks that we all face in our lives of things that could be problems. We are dependent on our fellow citizens. Uh, the example I like to use is, well, I mean, just a simple example, right? You think about, um, you think about, you watch violence, right? Somebody gets killed. Uh, there's a shooting in your town or something like that. And it, and it, and it fills your heart with chills and fear. But at the end of the day, uh, the scariest thing is just driving down the road. When you look around, and I think the place where we're most vulnerable is just recognize that you drive down any undivided highway, you're driving 45 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour, and you're passing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people driving 45, 50 or more miles an hour towards you. Any one of those people could take you out. And we're depending on the thinnest of controls, the thinnest of anything to, to, um, uh, to protect you in that situation. Those kinds of dangers are far more acute than the dangers we face from the loss of privacy of our DNA. That's a kind of a very, very distant thing. And yet at its core, we're dependent upon our, uh, our fellow citizens to drive carefully and do their best. And we know that people are hurt every single day from car accidents. So similarly, I think we have no choice except to trust our fellow citizens and to hope that, uh, in the fullness of time, good will prevail. Honesty prevails. People want to live in an honest and just society. I trust juries. Uh, obviously, if I were a lawyer, I probably wouldn't trust juries as much as I do, but I don't see that I have a choice. Like, What, what other choice do I have except to trust juries? Uh, again, we I just talked about the Innocence Project. We know that juries get it wrong, but we don't have a better system. And so I just hope that in the same way that if a government gets out of hand and they start doing crazy stuff with DNA, I hope that my fellow human beings will step in and stop that. And so with a combination of the ballot box and the soap box and the jury box and the cartridge box in some way or another, I hope that um, our fellow citizens will, will step up and, and do what needs to be done in order to restrain anyone who would commit evil with that kind of evidence. Trey in Texas, welcome to the show. How can I serve you today, sir? Hey, Joshua. Um, I, I think it'll be probably a pretty quick question. I just wanted to ask, so we're thinking about moving um, maybe in about a year or so, and I've got this really great long-term um, interest rate locked in on a, the house that I live in right now, and the house I live in right now is pretty desirable. I think it'll probably sell pretty, pretty well in any market, and my market tends to be pretty stable even during downturns. Um, so what I was thinking is I, I hate to give up that fixed long-term debt that you couldn't get now um but also don't really want to rent from a distance so i was thinking about maybe doing a seller finance that hopefully if rates are still high at the time maybe get like eight or ten percent um do you have any thoughts on that do you think it might be a good strategy uh, obviously i would have to pay the mortgage off right now um but i've got the cash to do that so it's kind of like a a compromise between just paying it off and letting it go forever and uh about renting, I guess. I don't see why you would do the two of them together. So, so let's separate them because I think you're conflating them unnecessarily. Number one, uh, if the value that you perceive of the mortgage rate is I've got this incredibly low mortgage interest rate, you're right. Uh, I don't expect, I mean, who knows? How do any of us know? But from a macroeconomic perspective, I don't expect in my lifetime, or at least not for the next few decades, for us to get anywhere near the mortgage rates that we've enjoyed for the last few years. And so if you've got a mortgage rate that's down in the twos, threes, fours, some people uh, down, depending on a 30 year, 15 year, et cetera, then, I mean, that thing is golden. And as far as I can tell, it's probably going to be golden for a long time. Some of the cheapest debt you'll ever have. And uh, holding on to that kind of debt, uh, or sorry, debt at that interest rate is probably going to be one of the best financial moves that you're going to that you're going to have. So, if you want to keep the house and rent it out and get rental income, your your monthly payment, the the, the spread 
is if, if you could if you could cash flow that house, it only gets better from here because all of your other competitive real estate investors who are wanting to rent out a house, they're going to have a much higher monthly payment than what you have. Uh, and so over time, I think it's a better bet that rents will increase and your costs as a percentage of your rental pay, your rental income will decline significantly. So if you're asking me if we're, the first part of the question is, should I keep the mortgage? If you want to be a landlord and you think this is a decent house for you to keep, I would keep the mortgage. Now flip that on its head for you to sell the house, you're not going to be able to sell the house unless you pay off the mortgage. So if you decide you're going to do seller financing and sell the house with seller financing, then what's the point of the first part of the question? You're going to wind up paying the mortgage off anyway. So I don't think that you should consider doing seller financing because of the low interest rate that you have on a mortgage that you're paying off, unless I'm missing something. Those seem to be at odds. So we to keep the house. No, no, you that, yeah, that you're, you're exactly right. What I was saying, I, 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 I take it's kind of like the inverse, right? So it's, I've got a low interest rate, which is great to be a borrower, but also on the flip side, because interest rates are up, and it's what's driving me not to want to pay off the low interest rate. It opens up an opportunity to potentially make money on the higher interest rates. Right. But right. yes, I do agree. Yeah. So if you could do both, I mean, if you can keep this house and then somehow figure out the payments so that you could safely swing just buying another house, I think that's a great move. Uh, you got one house to rent, one house to live in. You got one nice cheap mortgage uh, that you never pay off uh, early. And you got one more expensive mortgage that you may choose to chunk money towards. So if it works out that you feel like owning this rental house is a good deal, then great. Um, just remember, and I'm sorry for, to introduce confusion, but just remember, um, there's no guarantee that that the, ha the value of the current house doesn't go down. And so we don't know what's going to happen. And of course, in the next couple of years with real estate prices, there's good reason to think they're going down. Um, I think your, your phone number's from Texas. There's good reason to think Texas economy is going to be strong. So I guess my guess would be if the numbers could work, that you, uh, that you can keep that house and buy another house uh, eventually, even if you rent for a year or something, then do that. If the numbers don't work, then just recognize some lots of times in personal finance, we make a decision and we don't do the quote unquote optimal thing with our money because this is personal finance. Uh, you're not a bank. You're a man. You need a house to live in. And if you can't afford two mortgage payments, well, then you can get rid of the old mortgage payment and you get another one. Um, but we do that acknowledging the fact that, hey, this might be a suboptimal move, but I don't have the money to buy two houses right now. So this is personal finance. The goal of my money is to fund my life. I don't serve money. Money serves my life. I've decided it's best for my family to move. And so for that reason, we're going to go and sell the house, pay off the mortgage, buy another house, even though we have a higher interest rate. I think that's perfectly fine. Great. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And it, it gets even better than that, actually, because we're probably going to go live in our vacation house which is closer to our family which is where we're trying to get to anyway so cool. we wouldn't even hope it. maybe the market does go down a little bit in that meantime and we get a better deal when we decide to buy our bills but love it yeah yeah just always remember that i mean at the end of the day we do suboptimal things with money because it's personal finance if our goal was to be the world's greatest misers and accumulate as much money as possible, we'd never do anything that costs us money. We eat gruel every day to keep calories coming in. We'd never leave our house. We live in the smallest house, et cetera. So everything is a trade-off. Personal finance is not about getting as rich as possible. It's about deciding what we want and the lifestyle that we want to live and then doing our best to make intelligent decisions given the constraints of our lifestyle. We go to Justin in Orlando. Justin, welcome to the show. How can I serve you today? Hey, Joshua, I might heard one for you today, and I'm going to ask, and I'll, I'll, I'll listen back. Um, I know you've done extensive travel as a family with the year or so in the RV in the U.S., or maybe internationally too, and then I know during 2020 and 2021, you were traveling abroad for a long time, and I was just wondering, uh, as a family, with young kids and everything, what are some of the, your favorite places you've traveled to, and, and maybe if you also want to have you know, any uh, places that you intend to travel to or goals, the places that you want to go with? <laughs> Places I intend to travel to is everywhere. <laughs> I intend to. Agreed. I have, a, I have a chart on my wall that has the, um, there's a great uh, website called travelbible.co, I think it is. Uh, anyway, they, 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 they got me with a, a social media ad and they have this great suite of prod, products for travelers. And so I bought their uh, uh, passport stamps of the world chart. And so I have on my wall a, a chart of 
uh, every country's passport stamp and it's a peel and peel off a scratch off chart. So I've scratched off, of course, the countries that, that I've taken my children to. And eventually in the fullness of time, I'd love to take them everywhere. Now, obviously I, I, I may or may not get to that because it's traveling is like that is a big commitment. But, uh, as far as where I'd go, I'd like to go, uh, I'd love to go anywhere. Now that leads me conveniently into the, your, your second question, which is like, where do you want to go? Um, I personally don't discriminate based upon the kind of travel. I genuinely think that any tra- what travel does is it exposes you to different and unique sets of uh, adventures. And so uh, there are some that I'm more drawn to, but you know, for example, I like to be where that's beautiful, there's space, I like to be out in nature, I enjoy national parks, and I think with children that works really well. It's very relaxing to be in big parks, national parks, etc. with children and to see beautiful natural scenery. But if you ask me if I want to take my children to New York City, absolutely I want to take my children to New York City. Uh, absolutely I want to take my children to Hong Kong or to Tokyo. It's not that I don't want to go to the city. It's just that, uh, and so if I have the opportunity to go to the city, I'm going to take advantage of it whenever I can because my philosophy with children is that by exposing them to a diverse set of experiences, they learn a lot. Uh, in terms of travel styles, for example, sometimes we stay at five-star resorts. Those are nice. I really enjoy that. Sometimes we stay in really uncomfortable accommodations. I don't enjoy that very much, but I'm really glad to give that experience to my children because I want them to be flexible. I don't want them to be you know, highfalutin and think that they have to stay at a five-star resort to have a nice time. I want them to be uncomfortable and to learn what it's like to be uncomfortable. And so, and I approach that my own with my own thinking that even when you have really uncomfortable experiences you're on some third class train overnight you can't sleep you're boiling with sweat etc that's miserable it's absolutely miserable but guess what you get a great story to tell and that's probably the thing that's going to stand out to your children um, if you go on a camping trip and it rains constantly and everybody is miserable and hot and sweaty and your tent is full of water etc and you pack up early and go home well, guess what? That's the story that you're going to repeat every single family holiday for the coming years, and it just becomes part of your family lore. So I welcome diverse experiences, regardless of whether they're my pref- preferred experiences or not. Now let's come back to the first part. Here's what I have learned traveling with children. With young children, they're not going to remember the, the destinations. Uh, And that can be a little bit annoying because if you're going to go out and spend thousands of dollars taking your children to some spectacular destination or do something that is just an amazing bucket list item, they're not going to remember it. You take pictures of it and they remind themselves when they look at the pictures. My wife does yearbooks for each of the children, so they love to look at their yearbooks. Uh, I just mean she puts all the photos together, prints it out, um, puts text in there. And so the children love to go through their yearbooks and look at where they've been, but they don't remember it. It's just they're reminded by the pictures, and that's one of the reasons we do it, but they don't remember the place because they were very young. Uh, And so don't put a lot of stock. If there's something that's really important to you that they remember and they're young, and by young, I would say, you know, under six, I'm making that up somewhere five, six, seven, I've noticed that there's just that big change. Very few of us remember much that happened before that age. Uh, And so they're not going to remember much. Uh, Then you get to what can mom and dad handle? There is, and what do mom and dad enjoy? There is a major difference in stress of traveling with children depending on the mode of transit, depending on the age of your children. So I've taken five-year-olds and three-year-olds across the ocean. It's not super fun, uh, especially when they're, when they're at an age before they can read, before they can be entertained. Airplanes are not super fun, um, just not enjoyable. Now, you deal with it if that's what you got to do, but it's not fun. Uh, long, long days in the car are not super fun for, for parents. And so it's nicer when you have younger children to stay uh, closer to home or to arrange short hops, short airplane hops, uh, etc., Uh, I don't particularly enjoy staying in hotels with children. Uh, It's necessary, and I've done lots of it, but it's not super fun uh, because what are are they going to do? There's not a lot to do, and you wind up watching TV or or, or doing – that's about it. Uh, And so you you can stay in hotels, but I, I myself prefer to be in a campground. My favorite mode of transport or of travel with children, the thing that I think is the best for parents, is some form of RV. And my reason is simply this. 
when you are traveling, you have a constant string of expenses and decisions and all your decisions are expenses and that making those decisions and outlaying that money on a daily basis can be a it can be very stressful to figure out what to do especially when you have children if you're traveling as an adult or even a couple uh, and you everyone and you're hungry but there's no reasonably priced uh, food around uh, you just suck it up. You just deal with the fact that I'm hungry because you're an adult and you can control your emotions. But when you've got three children, or in my case, five children that are little and they're whining because their tummies are full, I tell them, suck it up, be tough. And then five minutes later, they're telling me that they're hungry again. And I say, be tough. And what we're still working on, be tough. <laughs> and so you, you're constantly thinking, where's the food going to come from? Where am I going to get food? And you're constantly anticipating as a parent, all right, I need they need to eat. They need to eat. Where are they going to eat? We're going to have food, et cetera. And so the logistics are annoying. When you have an RV, you always know where you're going to sleep and you always know where you're going to eat because you have food in the refrigerator. You can stop at the grocery store. You, everyone's hungry. You pull over on the side of the road, you eat, and you continue on. And so knowing where you're going to sleep and knowing where you're going to eat is, takes a huge amount of stress off. So then you're free to focus on what you're going to do today. Uh, where are we going to go? What are we going to see? What are we going to do today? And it's a much more relaxing way of traveling than any other mode of travel. Now, RVing works really great in the United States uh, and in North America. Uh, and so uh, it also works well in Europe. Uh, it doesn't work so well in Africa, doesn't work very well in Asia because you don't have as strong of an infrastructure. Yeah, you can do it in Latin America. Uh, it's possible, but you have a different style of RV. Uh, and so, you know, depend, cho choosing where you're going to go for that reason is important. So my, my, my recommendation is do some form of RV travel if you have the money to buy a rig or if that fits your vision in some way because you'll enjoy it as a parent more than anything else. You also get good economies of scale. So with children, there are some expenses that scale and some that don't don't. Uh, airplane tickets, you pay for a ticket for every single one. Uh, restaurant food, you pay for basically food for every single one. And so you don't get a lot of economies of scale. Hotels, uh, you can fit into hotels. If you can fit into one hotel room with basically up to three children, uh, sometimes four. What I did when we had four would be to stay at the suites hotels. And those worked really well because uh, there are a lot of brands that offer suites and they'll usually come with two queen beds and a fold out sofa. And so I've been able to get great deals on those and that has worked really well. We've outgrown those now. And so now we're in the world of two hotel rooms. And so hotel rooms, they add quite a lot. And you wind up spending quite a lot of money on that stuff. And when you're traveling and you think about the money, that's really significant because a lot of times things like transportation and accommodation are actually your biggest expenses. So let's say you're going to take a trip to Europe and uh, you're going to go for two weeks and you're flying from, say, the East Coast of the United States. So pretty easy to find round trip tickets for, yeah, let's call it 600 bucks, right? Uh, more or less, depending on where you're going, but 600 bucks round trip. If you're a family, if you're a single person and you're going to Europe for 14 days and you divide the cost of your $600 ticket over the course of 14 days, that's an average daily cost of $42 a day. So you add on to that, you know, let's call it hundred to $150 a day for a hotel. If you're staying in normal hotels, add on to that, your food, 50 to hundred dollars a day. So you're at a budget of about 200 to $250 a day. If you're not trying to just save as much money as possible. Now do that same exact trip with children and now, and you have, there's five of you. Well, now you're at $3,000 for plane tickets and you divide that $3,000 into 14 days and you're at $214 a day of amortized plane tickets. Uh, and then uh, you ha your your hotel expenses would be similar, right? Hundred to hundred fifty dollars a day, and your food expenses will be a hundred to two hundred dollars a day um, with the added with the added uh, costs uh, of of children's food. So the point is that your transportation tickets are wind up being your biggest category. And so the way that you cut that down is by extending your time. So any kind of travel that you can do to extend your time, if you took a, a 60 day trip to Europe instead of a uh, 14 day trip, then your daily cost of tickets would be $100 a day instead of $214 a day. So you get a lot more bang for your buck when you can travel slower or travel on itineraries that are lower. And then bring that together with the fact that um, 
the best way to travel a lot and then save money is to keep a close, to do it affordably, is not to choose where you want to go and then go there, but rather choose where it's cheap to go and then figure out what there is to do there. So this mindset shift, and, and I'm still answering your question of like, what do you want to do? Or what do you like to do with children? Where do you think you should go? This is the mindset shift that allows some people to travel a lot. You get used to, you get, you figure out where it's inexpensive for you to go and you book your tickets because accommodation is pretty much the same everywhere. Now there's a clear difference between the cost of staying in downtown New York city versus the cost of staying in on the outskirts of Kansas city. There's big difference in terms of accommodations, but big cities are big cities. You know, who's going to pay more for hotel expenses. Um, sm- out of the side of the city is, is smaller. So so you're aware of that. But other than that, your biggest daily cost, especially with children, is going to be ticket cost. So you figure out where it's inexpensive for you to travel to, and then you figure out what's interesting to do in that location. And if you do that, you wind up being able to travel a lot. And that's where I think the attitude of just simply enjoying whatever, you know, whatever adventure emerges along the way and treating them all as, as pleasant. Uh, if you are in a big city, sometimes you go, there's a wonderful zoo and that is a great experience. Or sometimes walking the streets and seeing some spectacular memorial or going into a history museum or an art museum or something like that. These are really important uh, activities, just like it's important to stay in a national park and have lots of time there to, to visit and, and enjoy just hanging out in the woods. So those would be my general approaches is I want to go everywhere. I value all the, the circumstances. I set aside money, and this is how I and I use this philosophy to try to figure out what's best to do at any one particular time. So where can I go that's inexpensive or affordable? What style of travel can I handle? Uh, North America, RV, Europe, RV, uh, or train. Trains can work, but it's not as good. RV is great. Uh, but Asia, okay, I'm not going to be RVing around Asia, at least not me. It's, it's, it's not going to work. All right, he dropped off, so we'll go to Dave in Texas. Dave, you're up. How can I serve you today, sir? Hey, how's it going, Josh? Very well. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so I'm a financial advisor. Actually, we've, we've had a couple chats in the past before, but um, I listened to your deep work podcast, uh, just the one you just did, and thought it was really good. Good. And I'm trying to figure out how do I incorporate that as a financial advisor, right? Because I think about like prospecting and marketing, meeting with clients, um, just kind of basics. Like, how do I how do I incorporate that into my practice? Yeah. So as a financial advisor, uh, you first begin with what actually drives my revenue. And there are, there are three things. To, let's go with two or three things that are going to drive your revenue. So uh, do you do fee only or do you do insurance as well? I'm going to unmute you. Do you do fee only or do you do insurance as well? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I was muted. Um, yeah, both. So duly, yeah, okay. do uh, AUM and insurance. Great. So if you look at um, if you look at your lines of revenue, then you have two basic lines of revenue. You have insurance commissions, and you have fees that come from accounts. So insurance commissions are paid out as a percentage of premium. So you want, in order to maximize your revenue for every hour worked, you want to have the highest possible insurance premiums. Insurance premiums come from serving wealthy people who have big problems. So if you go and sell a $50,000 burial policy to some uh, not wealthy person, you make a little bit of money. If you sell a $20 million uh, whole life policy to a wealthy person, then you have the chance to make a lot of money. And so the driver, as you well know, is I want to serve the wealthiest people possible and then as many of them as possible. Then you flip it to money under management. We have the same exact thing. So your fees that you charge on AUM are based upon account size. And so every customer that you have, every client that you have is going to require a certain amount of your time and attention. Generally speaking, uh, your, your least wealthy clients require the most time and attention. Your wealthiest clients require less time and attention, and you earn a lot more money. And so the, this is the classic move in financial planning as to why do we want to work with wealthy people? Wealthy people have big financial problems for us to solve, and they, because they have big financial problems, they value our input. 
Poor people, they don't value the insight of a financial advisor. They don't value the work, etc. Wealthy people do because they have big problems to solve. So the first thing my, of my answer is you need to get very good at solving big problems. And so that's where self-education comes in. So when, you, a, when a wealthy person is looking to hire you, you are leading with your knowledge. So the way that you implement deep work is you become extraordinarily competent and knowledgeable at everything that your clients can do to solve their problems. And there's a lot that comes under that rubric. So that's everything from understanding the ins and outs of every insurance policy that you deal with, every company that you deal with, every uh, and every competitive company that you deal with, knowing where you can save fees, knowing where you can help someone get a better deal, knowing where you can get a product product design that's better, et cetera. When you look at it on the side of your investments, that becomes very skilled at knowing how to cut uh, investment costs as much as possible, how, knowing where to, uh, how to deal with uh, the very best investment options that your firm gives you access to, et cetera. And then you start adding on all, and layering on all those other skills that cause a client to really value you. Tax planning, estate planning, um, budget planning, uh, advice on inheritance issues, family office type issues, family planning, all of that stuff comes in. Uh, internationalization, etc. Everything that you can do to bring more and more value to a client enhances the client relationship. It increases your referability, your marketability, etc. So the first big, the first big, um, uh, answer is in education. Education makes a big difference. Now, assuming that you're strong on education, that you can give really good, high quality advice, you've studied everything related to money that you can possibly focus on. Now let's go and look at your day. So the only productive thing that you do on a day uh, that actually makes you money is you either meet with or service existing clients, or you prospect for and meet with prospective clients. That's it. And so in the life of a financial advisor, everything else is a waste of time. The only time that you're actually working, other than education, which you talked about, which you do not during work hours, the only time that you're actually working is when you're meeting with prospects and clients or working on their situation specifically, fulfilling the promises that you've made, or you're prospecting to meet with, uh, you're working to meet with prospects and clients. And so, and so then you say, how efficiently, how many prospects and clients can I meet with on a daily basis? So the guy who can sit in his office and has the knowledge base, the product set, and the, and the attractive power to a uh, to bring in a, a long string of, of, of customers, and the guy who can get seven meetings done four days a week is going to make infinitely more money than the guy who gets uh, you know three meetings a day four days a week, just because of the amount of time spent together. And then when we look at prospecting, you figure out how can I bring in the highest quality clients or prospective clients? How can I bring them in in the most efficient way possible? So this is why people do media. This is why people do semi I don't seminars. I don't think seminars, I don't know. I haven't heard of big success stories these days from seminars, but that was a classic thing. Well, if I can get 400 people in a room or 40 people in a room, then that's more efficient than one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and so I don't have a lot of... The, I don't, I can't tell you exactly with your market, your skills, qualifications, et cetera, how it works. But, but what I would focus most of my time on is to say, what is the most efficient way that I can be in front of the highest quality prospects and clients on a daily basis? If you have qualified yourself with knowledge, expertise, and experience to serve very high level clients, then I think the most important thing, the most important way for you to meet other, uh, prospects and clients comes from your current prospects and clients. So if your current prospects and clients are of the caliber that you're capable of serving, where they buy big insurance policies and they have big investment accounts, then you should spend most of your time trying to network from them to other people. Because when you come in as a referred lead and you are genuinely knowledgeable and your clients are happy, et cetera, then you can have a much easier time bringing in new prospects and filling your calendar with those, with those new prospects. Uh, if not, you have to go, if you're not working in that marketplace, then you have to qualify yourself for education and then figure out how to break into it. So then we come back to your calendar. If your calendar is full, 
and you have all of your meetings full. Deep work is d- deep work in the financial advice space is education, and it's having back, 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 back to back meetings, and so that you have a very full calendar. If your calendar is full, then that means that you have solved your pipeline problem, and uh, et cetera. And assuming that your your close rates are normal for the industry, at least if not good, then then the, then you've solved the most important thing. So then from then on. The only upgrade you can make, because you're limited by time, the upgrade that you make is by upgrading the market that you work in. And so you take a look at where you're succeeding and where you're not, and you look to say, is there a specialty market? Uh, you're right. A guy might a guy might have his calendar mostly full of quote unquote normal work, and then he might build a you know a coley business on the side. He, he spends a lot of time really getting involved and and goes out and starts selling corporate owned life insurance and very big policies that take very long to close. And there's a three year sales cycle, but at the end of it, there's a nice payday. But and so because you're limited by time, everything, once you've maximized the amount of time per week that you're in front of prospects and clients, then you use education and and mar- and prospecting to upgrade the level of the person that you are talking to. And that's the formula. It's not easy, but that's the formula. All right. Thanks. Appreciate that. My pleasure. All right. We go now to Andrew in Maryland. Andrew, welcome to the show. How can I serve you today? Andrew, you're up. We'll come back to you in a moment. We go to Houston, Texas. Welcome to the show. How can I serve you today? All right. Andrew jumped on with a different number. Andrew, can you hear me? Go ahead. Hey, Josh. Can you hear me? Yep. Sounds good now. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure to finally connect with you. Um, I just had two questions, uh, one on just general career advice and the second on just understanding uh, insurance policies a bit. Okay. All right. So I guess I can start with the insurance policy. Um, so I have a parent policy currently and I ended up picking up a IUL policy. Okay. And when I picked up the IUL policy, I was I was trying to get an idea of the benefits of it and I had a good walkthrough with the insurance specialist that I work with, but one of the things I was trying to just figure out when it comes to payouts and a lot of that information of God forbid something happened or if I need to actually use and tap into the insurance policy. Is there any statistics or anything I will look for to understand what's the likelihood of a payout, the percentages, what are some things that do or don't result in payouts? So uh, to clarify, you have a term life insurance policy and you also recently bought an indexed universal life policy. That's what IUL stands for. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And why did you buy the indexed universal life policy? Yeah, so I bought the Index Universal Life Policy because as the specialist walked through with me, um, so it has two components. It has a component that if I were to be disabled and I had any health issues, um, I'd be able to tap into that. So it's like a combination of like a term and like a component of IUL. So that was the main reason, uh, just to kind of, uh, if I had any issues before, God forbid, death, like terminal illness, I can use the funds for that. So that was the main thing that attracted me to the policy. Okay. So first, um, let's just back up a little bit and explain kind of what is this, this, these ideas. So the term life insurance is simple. It's simple to understand. You pay a premium uh, every month or every year. And uh, for, the, for the, as long as the company said they'd give you insurance, if you die during that period and you've continued to pay premiums, your family will get the death benefit from the policy. And if you don't die uh, during that, pre- that period of time, the insurance company will keep your premiums. Uh, when you purchase an indexed universal life insurance policy, we need to pull apart those words to understand uh, what they are. So let's start with universal life. Universal life is a funny, extremely complex, very flexible insurance product that brings together 
uh, some of the components of term life insurance mixed with some of the components of what is traditionally called whole life insurance. And the way it works is you have a life insurance policy and that life insurance policy every single year can be renewed for another year up through the date of death. Inside the policy, there is an annual premium that is assessed to the policy. And uh, each year, because you're getting older, the cost of that premium goes up. Now, you put premiums into the policy. You make payments to the policy, and those payments that you put into the contract start to accumulate in what are called cash values. And those cash values are invested. We'll talk in a moment about how. But those cash values are invested into the contract. And every single year, the internal premium that the life insurance policy requires for another year of existence needs to be paid from those cash values. If there is enough money in the cash value to pay for the next one year policy uh, internal to the contract, then you'll have insurance for another year. If there's not enough money in the cash value, then you'll get a big bill uh, that you'll have to put more money in. And, uh, and so if there's not enough money, then the policy will lapse. So universal life insurance can be kept for your entire lifetime, but you have to keep a very close eye on the numbers to make sure that there's always enough money in the cash value in order for that premium payment to be made each year to keep the insurance in force. I don't, I don't have a statistic uh, on this. I'm making a, an opinion statement here. Most universal life po policies do not last for life because people don't put enough money into them. Now, I again, I don't have an industry statistic, so I could be mistaken on that. That's just by, been my professional experience and my observation. So most universal life insurance policies, people don't keep them forever, often because they don't put enough money into them in the beginning. So let's talk about putting money into them. Yours is an indexed policy. What does indexed mean? Well, it means that each year inside the contract, the contract is going to refer to an index, usually a stock market index, to determine how much uh, interest gets paid inside of the contract. Uh, the way that this index is calculated is that there is a floor. Usually that floor is 0%. So if there is a year in which, say, for example, the S&P 500 is negative for a year, then your insurance uh, value, your contract value is not going to go down because the lowest it's capped. Whereas if the stock market performs underneath 0%, then it stops at 0%. If the stock market returns this year 3.2%, then usually your insurance contract will participate in that 3.2%. And so your, your account will be credited by 3.2%. Uh, and then usually there's a ceiling, a maximum cap. And so if the stock market goes up by 24% this year, your contract may be capped at, say, 10%. And so you'll get a 10% growth in or 10% interest rate that's credited to your account this year. This is not a direct participation in the market. So this is different than variable universal life where you do have direct participation. You have an indexed universal life policy, so your, your account is indexed to the market, but you don't participate in the high highs and you don't participate in the negative years. So your account value is going to be credited each year by some percentage based upon how that index performs. So if you put a lot of money into the insurance contract and then that money is getting uh, is growing based upon the uh, the uh, value the performance of the index then you can build a large cash value in the insurance contract and that cash value represents money that you could access prior to dying there are a few ways that you can access it but that's the money that you could access so um in, in this policy design, um, that's how it works. Now, there, there are advantages and disadvantages. Um, I don't want to be the guy to say that you shouldn't, that anybody shouldn't do something. Because because to be clear, I don't know anything about your situation. I don't know anything about what you did. I'm just trying to speak generally. I don't like indexed universal life insurance contracts. I've never sold one. I've never bought one. And I'll explain to you why. In my opinion... 
when you buy an indexed contract, the reason people buy indexed annuities or indexed insurance contracts is because they're trying to participate and they're trying to exercise their greed in order to participate in the upside of the stock market, but they don't want to have any downside risk. That's why people buy them. I want the upside of the stock market, but I don't want any downside risk. And so they feel really good by saying, hey, I'm getting a high performance, but I'm, getting, uh, I'm not getting any downside risk. The problem is this. The stock market, the way it works, generally speaking, equities, they function by extremes because there are large swings of panic and euphoria, and, and they function by extremes. And so if you, if you slice off all of, the, all of the negative years, but you also slice off all of the positive years above 10%, Frequently, whenever I've done the analyses in the past, you wind up with a pretty mediocre investment product. It's just pretty mediocre. The value from the stock market comes from the volatility. The reason that stocks pay more than bonds is because they have to, to compensate people for the risk, the volatility. And so when you invest into stocks, you do that knowing I'm going to stomach the volatility because I'm hoping to get paid for that volatility with higher performance returns. But if you slice off the top range of performance returns because your index is limited to, say, 10% or 7% or whatever your contract says, your actual returns are pretty anemic. They're pretty low because you have a lot of years of 0% and you've got some years of 3%, 4%, but without those big 25% years, then the actual performance is pretty mediocre and pretty anemic. So that's the reason I don't like indexed policies. I think, and, and so then we pair that, I don't like indexed universal life insurance policies because they don't have any of the securities of whole life. Whole life insurance of the traditional whole life contract gives you a guaranteed or gives you a premium. Let me be careful. Um, that is generally guaranteed. There is a guaranteed premium, depending on how you design it. And the policies are built on very conservative assumptions. They are generally not going to perform as high as a, an equity based market based insurance contract, because generally stock should outperform, uh, uh, life insurance because life insurance is invested in fixed income. But what they do is they give you certainty and predictability. So if you want a life insurance policy that's going to last forever, then that's why you buy whole life insurance. And if you want predictable cash value growth, you buy whole life insurance because as long as you pay the premiums, then the policy values don't go down. They continue to go up and over time they work pretty well. And so I, I think that most ordinary people should do stock market investing in their IRAs and in their 401ks. And, for, and then if you want whole life insurance, buy whole life insurance rather than an indexed universal life insurance contract. So I, I've never sold a policy like that. I've never recommended one. Um, I'm open to them being in some cases, but there, there are, there's recommendations. Now, the next, that, that's, that's just my general perspective, and, and that's why. The next thing you need to be careful of with any kind of universal life insurance contract, or frankly, any insurance contract, is that there is an expense ratio that is then charged on the money. And so each year in your insurance contract, you'll have a mortality and expense charge. And that mortality and expense charge is, is billed alongside the insurance premium to your contract. And so if that mortality and expense charge is high and you're billing, getting that billed plus the premium for your one-year term contract, and then all of that's being taken off of a capped index, I think that overall the performance of that is pretty anemic. So I would only want you to be participating in this contract after you are fully funding 401ks, 403bs, solo 401ks, SEP IRAs, whatever you have access to, and Roth IRAs uh, for yourself and, and HSAs. After those accounts are all full, then we come back to some form of cash value life insurance. The next uh, component of uh, of your question is, well, what about getting it in terms of in form of disability, et cetera? Now, I'm not quite clear on exactly what you have, but you're mixing up a number of things that they could be. So let me just generally talk about what they what your options could be. First, 
when you have cash value in a life insurance contract, you have the ability to access that cash value at any time for any reason that you want. There are a few ways that you can access it. The first way you can access it is by simply doing a withdrawal. So you can call the insurance company and you can say, send me cash value, and they'll send you cash value. The first cash value will come in in terms of what's called a return of premium. That return of premium will come to you tax-free because it's return of premium. There's no gain on it. And then if you surrender the policy and you have gain that's coming to you, they'll lower your insurance amount and you'll pay tax on it. You can also do a policy loan. So you can call the insurance company and say, hey, listen, I got 50 grand on this insurance contract. I need 40 grand to go and close on a house. Send me 40 grand. They'll loan you from the policy $40,000. You go close on the house. You refinance the house later. And then you send them a check for $40,000 and you put the money back in. You can do it for any reason that you want. You don't have to wait for disability uh, or sickness or anything. You can do it anytime for any reason. It, the cash values are yours to, to do that with based upon the terms that are written in the contract. You may also have some form of waiver of premium rider on the contract. A waiver of premium rider says that if you become disabled, language varies, but usually it's totally disabled, uh, so or presumptively totally disabled. So totally disabled means you can't do any work, depending on the con company, it might be anywhere at work for by which you're reasonably suited to training experience, et cetera, or any work at all. Uh, that's where we get into the defin the contractual definitions of disability. The insurance terms for these are any occupation or own occupation, and there are varieties of these. So any occupation means you're disabled if you can't do any occupation at all. Uh, that's a hard one to meet because most people can say, hi, welcome to Walmart, or here, come on through the door, et cetera. Own occupation means you're disabled if you can't do what you're trained to do, what your job is at the time of disability. Uh, and so uh, if that if that's the case and you're totally disabled, then they'll pay the insurance contract for you. That's called a waiver of premium rider. You may also have some form of rider on the contract that's something like an accidental death and disability or accidental death and dismemberment rider. So there may be an advance. And then sometimes there's a rider of some form of, uh, terminal illness rider where you can get an advance on a death benefit if you're diagnosed with a terminal disease uh, or some variation of that. So what I'm pointing out is if you're just talking about being having access to the cash values, you have no need to wait until you're disabled. You can just gain access to the cash values at any time. If you, if the insurance agent talked to you about some uh, clause related to actual disability, then it's likely a waiver of premium which means that they would waive the premiums, meaning you don't have to pay them if you get disabled, or some form of accidental death and dismemberment or, or other uh, uh, terminal illness rider for an advanced death benefit, et cetera, something like that. Let me pause there. Do any of those terms make sense? Do you want to ask a clarifying question now based upon what I've said, big picture? No, no, it really helped. Um, I don't have like the policy right for me at the moment, but everything you mentioned, um, it makes sense. And for the situation it's a writer and i believe it's a accidental death okay. um writer so i think everything you're saying makes sense now with that um with the iol and having that as a writer i guess one of the concerns or one of the things that I was rusting with was i have the policy now and i already had a term policy before i had that one but the main thing that drove me to that was that um illness and disability mm -hmm. um and that kind of sold me so I, I still had the term and mm -hmm. the term and then i could just name places the terms was northwestern mutual with the old other company and this one was national life group mm -hmm. and when i did that the other insurance provider kind of reached out to me they were thinking that i was going to leave the uh other term with the northwestern mutual so they kind of showed me or mentioned to me how i shouldn't do it and they kind of present their own analysis as to what the risk would be to go to that insurance company. So I guess that's what kind of made me dig deeper to kind of even see that concern about would the insurance provider pay out if, God forbid, something happened to me and I was disabled or life. Like, is there a likelihood they wouldn't pay that out? Right. And it sounds like there might be some extreme examples where, or good examples where they wouldn't, if unless it's a particular illness, like a list of them. But if mm -hmm. it's just generally, oh, you know, I can't, you know, my eye hurts or I literally can't see anymore. 
it may or may not be right. It just depends on the fine print. So there are a few, there are a few things. First of all, I would love you to talk to a couple more insurance agents because, uh, there are some insurance based solutions that will solve your problems. And I would probably be more comfortable with a variety of solutions different than what you're describing here. Uh, I'm no longer a licensed insurance agent. So this is just generalized education. Uh, I, when I was an insurance agent, I worked for Northwestern Mutual. So I am biased in favor of the company because at the time I felt like I was working for uh, one of the finest companies that had really good, strong products. And I really understood their product set and I really understood their value proposition. And I could happily, if I went broke, I could happily go back and work there again. But there are a few things that you need to identify. First, if you're concerned about having money, if you became disabled, you should not buy a life insurance policy. You should buy a disability income insurance policy. That is the most important thing. Because if you are disabled, you need income and you're not going to get that income from a life insurance policy. Even if these riders that you have purchased uh, all function at their highest, you know, beautifully, it is not going to provide you with income. So if you are concerned about what would happen to me if I got sick or hurt and couldn't work, go and talk to an insurance agent and examine, uh, get advice from an insurance agent on disability income insurance. That is what it is for. If I could only own one kind of insurance, I would not buy life insurance. I would not buy health insurance. I would buy disability income insurance. It is the most important kind of insurance for you to have, Uh, period. That's the first thing. So talk to an insurance agent about disability income insurance and understand the differences and ask the agent about the differences between disability income insurance and your index universal life insurance policy with the riders that you've purchased. Take the contract that you've purchased to a different insurance agent and ask that insurance agent to explain to you the riders uh, that you have and just make sure that you get, that you really understand them or read, pull open your contract and read the contract. Very few, the contracts are actually pretty clear. Um, I used to, when I sold insurance, I would always just beg my clients, like, listen, read the contract. They're not that hard. They're not that long. It might put you to sleep a little bit, but just pull it open and read it. Cause it describes in plain language, what you have and what you don't have. Um, so if you want income for If you want income in case of disability, you need disability income insurance. If you want to invest and you want to invest in the stock market, then your first thing should be to fund your retirement accounts and to buy stocks in your retirement accounts if you can handle the volatility because you can get better stocks that have higher possible returns and lower uh, and and, and, uh, higher possible returns and in a better tax-advantaged way inside of all of the retirement accounts that are available to you. Now, if you have studied the stock market and you have decided that it's not for you, and you've decided that, no, actually what I want is I, don't, I, want, uh, I want upside benefits with no downside risk or however the, the marketing stuff says it. Okay, that's fine. It's your money. And if you've decided that's what's, what's best for you, then that's your prerogative. And that's where you would come back to some form of indexed uh, insurance policy. It could be an indexed universal life insurance policy or an indexed annuity. I'm not a fan but I but it's you but it's I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying I think that you should train yourself to to handle volatility, and so I have always tried to 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 teach and to to show that if you practice good financial planning, uh, having proper amounts of money in savings, having proper um, insurance coverages, having a diversified perspective, etc., then you'll do better. Then you, you'll you'll do better than then you can do better with good financial planning and good and training yourself to be a good investor versus buying uh, insurance products that appeal to fear like the indexed uh, products uh, do. There have been a few occasions where I've reviewed some of these contracts and I said that was really good. I remember years ago when I was an insurance agent, um, I, I, I shared the same opinion then as I do ha- now that index products have a very limited usefulness. Client brought in this index annuity that he bought I went through it with another advisor with fine tooth comb. The promises that that company had made to him were extraordinary. 
And I told him, <laughs> I said, I've never seen a contract this good. And we, by the way, it wasn't available anymore. I said, don't ever let anybody replace this, et cetera. Don't, don't, um, don't ever let anyone replace this. It's a, it's a gold mine. If the company can stay in service, this is the best contract you've ever had. And so I try to be careful making sweeping statements. I'm seeking to share with you very clearly what my opinion is, but not make any statement since I have not reviewed the contract. I've not reviewed the insurance company. I've not done that and I'm not going to. Um, but, uh, but I've shared a little bit of philosophy and, and trying to tell you how, how to approach it. Uh, uh, two more comments. Number one, recognize, you sound like a young man, recognize that financial products are not going to build wealth. They're not going to get you wealthy. Uh, financial products protect your income. That's what disability income insurance does. It protects your income for you if you're disabled. That's what life insurance does. It protects your income for your family if you, uh, if you die. But the most important area for your focus to be on is on, on increasing your income as high as possible and investing at the highest possible return that you can find for your investment capital. And usually, uh, if you are indeed a young man, based upon the sound of your voice, usually you will have a lot of opportunities that are closer to home for you. Purchasing a home, great move. Purchasing a rental property with leverage, often a great move. Investing in your own business, upgrading your career, upgrading your credentials, maxing out your retirement accounts. All of these are really good moves. Where financial products really come in to start to shine is when you get into your 40s and your 50s, you still have good earning years ahead of you. You're at the top of your career and you've pretty well maxed out. You don't see any kind of big options. There aren't any good places in your career to spend a lot of money. Um, you know, you can't benefit from more credentialization or from joining the elite mastermind group, et cetera. You kind of maxed all that stuff out by then generally. Uh, and you're, you have a, an income that is high enough that it causes all of the tax deferred buckets, retirement accounts, et cetera, to not just be significant for you, right? If you're making a hundred grand and you could put $50,000 aside into a combination of uh, various retirement accounts, well, you do that. You're making 800 grand, all of a sudden you just can't get enough money into retirement accounts uh, to, to make a difference. And so if your income is high enough that you need to, that you still want to be investing a lot of money after you've maxed out retirement accounts, that's where I think you start to look at this world of uh, more exotic insurance contracts. Uh, and that's where it can be really interesting. But before that, I don't think it's wise to, to deal in this world. The second comment I was going to make is this. Um, if you've replaced a contract that you had previously, that's first of all, you did replace it. That was why you heard from the rep on your original term insurance contract, uh, because they were replacing a contract. That means that you bought a contract from the first company and it was fairly recent. And then somebody came along and was replacing that contract with a new contract. So, uh, if you've replaced the contract, you do have rights of cancellation in your contract. So if you've just been delivered the contract or if you're still going through underwriting, et cetera, you can cancel the contract if you choose you don't want to have it uh, and you can get all your money back or you can, uh, or, but you can, and then if you if you're out of that if you're out of that two week free look period or different depending on your state, then you would have other rights. So just take a good good look at what you're doing. Um, it may doesn't sound to me like something that's a perfect fit for you, but I would refer you back to your insurance agents who have the legal duty uh, to help you with that carefully. That help. That helps. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yep, my pleasure. And with that, we come to the end of our Q and A show. I uh, hope the insurance contract, the insurance discussion is useful to you. Uh, my closing comments on that would simply be this. Always remember, insurance products are a marvel of our modern era. Uh, if we went back a few hundred years and you couldn't buy life insurance, it's so hard to provide for your family without it. And in today's world, the ability for a man to buy a life insurance policy to protect his wife and children if he dies, what a blessing. Insurance contracts are a marvel. They're a marvel that is broadly oversold. So you need to think carefully and understand what you're buying. I don't myself make blanket statements like some financial pundits do. Always buy this, don't buy this, etc. Um, because I have enough experience in financial planning that I can design 
I can tell you exactly where almost any financial product will fit and the kind of person. And I believe that financial experts should rec- rec- should should recognize and and esteem uh, respect the individuality of each person. Uh, just because a product may not be right for me doesn't mean that it's not right for someone else. Just because I might be comfortable with stock market volatility doesn't mean that somebody else is. And so uh, we need to respect other people and their and their their choices, but we also need to be careful. And so I, I try in all these questions to to describe why I would proceed in the order possible uh, and not and why I would go in, in different directions. So um, hope that was helpful to the rest of you. Just don't don't make broad sweeping statements about products, but educate yourself and understand exactly why you're going to do it. There is no more complicated insurance contract that you see in personal finance than an indexed universal life insurance contract. And whenever there's complications. It can be easy for people to misunderstand. Uh, Whole life insurance is bad enough to understand. There's so many moving parts. Very difficult to explain a whole life insurance policy to someone who's uninitiated and have them come away um, uh, feeling like they really understand it. Universal life insurance and especially index universal life insurance is twice as complicated. So that's why I spent so much time going through it. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to join me on next week's Friday Q&A show, go to patreon.com slash radical personal finance. If you'd like to book a consultation with me right now, there's a little over a dozen left. Uh, I think 15, something like that. Go to radical personal finance.com slash consult radical personal finance.com slash consult. With everything you have on your plate, earning your degree online seems impossible. But at Grand Canyon University, we specialize in helping you fit a master's degree in education into your busy day. Your graduation team, led by your own GCU counselor, provides you with the personal support you need to succeed. Achieve your goals with a plan and team behind you. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Visit gcu.edu.